Well, hello and good morning, everybody. How you doing? This is Jeremiah, and we are having another fun webinar today. You know, we try to run the gamut here, get some different subjects and all that. And obviously, you know, it's what this one is. This is from us here in the tech support side of things. And um, we obviously get a lot of questions about things that are not relating specifically to land effects. Um, and, uh, you know, people see us as a source of knowledge, I hope, <laughs> on kind of all things computer. And uh, this just kind of comes up. And, and so we're, we're trying this one out. You know, we've had our hardware recommendations webinar several years in a row now. And uh, we're finding this one to be kind of a companion to that one. So there'll actually be several references in this webinar to the upcoming hardware recommendations. But we're definitely going to go over some really good stuff because, uh, you know, uh, about 65, 70% or so of our users are sole practitioners. And then it, you know, kind of slowly increases from there. And that's kind of the office I grew up in. You know, the first, first network I put together as a kid, you know, we got the little coax cabling that was back in the day running from computer to computer in my dad's office because we had the three machines there um, and so I, I just definitely have a first-hand appreciation for that you know that size office very very common that kind of one to five stations but you know we're going to cover really up into the teens of computers and, um, you know, we have had that experience too. So we got a lot to share with you. So I'm going to stop talking here and get this kind of rolling. We are recording this. So you're going to be able to reference back. So you don't have to write down everything. <laughs> and there is a Q&A button at the bottom. Do please uh, make note of it. And I'd, I'd recommend just go ahead and click it now. It just pops up that Q&A box. Um, so it'll be a little quicker for you to type in a question. Uh, but you're also going to be see you're going to be able to see any answers uh, that we type out to anyone else's questions. So it makes a really nice companion uh, to the webinar. So um, that being said, I'm going to get this on over to Brian to take it away. Thank you, Chair, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, we're going to be going over computer networking basics. This is going to be geared for end users, so not necessarily the most techie people. Uh, but this can be scaled up for larger systems. And this is me. Uh, I've been working in the small office, home office sector for a long time. So hopefully some of the things I've learned, I can pass on to you. And this is an outline of what we're gonna be covering today. Hopefully it's gonna be in a way that's gonna be easy to digest and remember. And you know, don't worry, uh, you can always watch the webinar after if you miss anything. So I want you to put yourself in this position. What happens when it fails? The fact of life is hardware and software fail. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. So what happens when it breaks? Um, your server's dead, your NAS is fried, uh, your router's out of commission, or your internet's down. Uh, how are we gonna set up your network so any of those don't stop you from working? Uh, I know the cost of getting this all set up may seem a bit steep, but if you figure that a server outage could put you out of work for three days, plus thousands of dollars to replace it, the cost kind of comes into perspective. So let's start off with where does your internet come from? Uh, your ISP is your internet service provider. So AT&T, Charter Spectrum, Verizon, something like that. Uh, but what kind is it? Um, there's three big ones you may have. So the first is DSL, which stands for Digital Subscriber Line. Uh, internet through your phone line. This is basically one step above dial-up. Don't buy it unless it's the only thing that's available. Uh, the next is cable internet, which works, works on much the same principles as DSL, uh, except with much higher speeds available. Um, that coaxial line that carries your television has a lot of extra bandwidth, which we can use for internet. Um, this will typically be the best you can get in, in an area. And then last, we have fiber. Now, this is the gold standard. This is what you want. Um, if you don't have it, you don't know what you're missing out on, you know, regular speeds of 250 megabytes up and down, um, that is if it's available in your area. Now, real quick, let's go over what those speeds actually mean. What do those numbers stand for? So say you have cable internet at 30 by 3. That means you download 30 megabytes per second, and then you upload or send back 3 megabytes per second. So say your friend has a drawing file that's 10 megabytes. Then you could download three of those to your computer 
every second. But if you want to send that same file back, it takes a little over three seconds to send just one of them. Uh, that being said, all speeds are estimates. Uh, speeds are going to vary depending on your internet connection, uh, the line quality, your modem, your ISP's bandwidth, number of devices in the chain. Um, the trick is, is that as software goes more and more cloud-based, the faster and more stable your internet is, the better your life's going to be. So no matter what kind of internet you have, it's going to come in through the wall to your modem. Now, the modem receives information from your ISP through the wire in your wall into your business and converts that into a digital signal. The router's job is to push this signal out to all your connected devices, either through wired ethernet cables or Wi-Fi. So that way all your devices can hop on board and access the internet. So your router and ISP can't communicate directly because they speak different languages, or rather they transmit different signal types, which is why the modem's role as a translator is so important. Um, your, your modem will typically be provided by your ISP, which will then connect to your router. Uh, now your router, that's the thing that's gonna get the internet to all your devices. So some things we're gonna go over before um, is one of them is a big question of router versus switch. What's the difference? Um, computers can be connected to either, uh, they can be connected to each other either via switch or a router. So the most basic explanation is that a switch is designed to connect computers within a network while a router is designed to connect multiple networks together. Uh, another piece of, piece of kit you're gonna want is VoIP. VoIP stands for Voice Over Internet Protocol. VoIP phones are a must at this point. Uh, VoIP is a category of hardware and software that enables people to use the internet as the transmission medium for telephone calls by sending voice data in packets using internet protocol rather by traditional phone circuit transmissions. So one advantage of VoIP is that telephone calls over the internet do not incur a surcharge beyond what the user is already paying for internet access, much in the same way that a user doesn't pay for sending every single email over the internet. So your dedicated phone lines from the telephone company are just going to be more expensive. And the technology has come a long way too. Uh, it used to be you could absolutely tell when somebody was using a VoIP phone. There'd be delays and drops, not dissimilar from bad cell service. Uh, but mostly we have those worked out at this point. I mean, here at the office, we used to pay $1,500 a month for six phone lines. When we switched to VoIP, that cost dropped to $300. Now, specifically, that price was for hosted VoIP, uh, essentially cloud VoIP. Somebody else has the hardware needed for your phone system to work. You don't want another piece of hardware to manage. Let somebody else do that. You know, IP phones are simple to install, even for people with limited technical know-how, rather than having someone come and run phone line through your facility, you just plug in an IP phone and be ready to go. Your WAP. So WAP stands for wireless access point. And this is how you're gonna be getting your Wi-Fi. Most home routers will have this built in. Those are those little antennas sticking out of your router. Uh, though they're not exactly necessary, they do look cool. Um, your router will not necessarily have this built in, which is a good thing. Uh, we'll talk more about making sure your equipment is rack mounted, but that rack will most likely not be in a place that's conducive to having the whole office get reception. A separate WAP solves this issue and gives you control over where your Wi-Fi reaches. Part of network security is trying to keep your Wi-Fi signal confined to in your business. This limits the chances of someone jumping on your network from the building next door or a car in the street. Now, remember that speed chart we just had? Five gigahertz Wi-Fi is almost as fast as slow fiber internet. And that's what you want. It's still not gonna be as good as your gigabit ethernet, but it'll be much better than the congested and slower 2.4 gigahertz. Put a 5G uh, WAP in every room in your office and you'll be super happy with your Wi-Fi. PoE. Uh, your VoIP and your WAP rely on a cool piece of technology called PoE. It's power over ethernet. This makes both of those things possible pro by providing power in the same cable as data. If you look caref carefully at the ethernet cord, you'll see there's eight individual wires in the cord. Not all of those wires are used to transmit data. Uh, PoE takes advantage of this and allows power to be transmitted at first on just those unused ones, and then in later versions, we can use all eight wires or some combination. 
Now, recently, the power possible has been raised to 100 watts. So some pretty powerful applications are within our reach. Uh, for most of us, though, being able to power your phone, WAP, and maybe IP cameras without having to run extra power cords that can often be difficult and expensive to install makes this technology save money very quickly. Not only that, but moving a desk or shifting the best spot for the Wi-Fi to, say, the conference room is going to be as easy as running some more Ethernet. Okay, so now the router itself. Now, this is a piece of kit you're gonna to wanna to spend some money on. You wanna get a good one, make sure it's gonna last a long time and expand with you. You want a minimum of a gigabit router. Now, that would be a theoretical speed of 1,000 megabytes per second. I know we were just talking about internet speeds of 30 megabytes per second, but that's coming from the outside. Your router will be deciding how fast you can talk to your server, or your NAS, the other devices on your network, like your printer. So you may only get 30 megabytes of internet from the outside, but if your land affects database is local, you want that to be more like 1,000. You're gonna want a minimum of a 12 port router with PoE. Now this may seem like a lot for a smaller company, but look at it this way. Let's say you have two employees, so that's three desktop computers, and then you got three VoIP phones, so there's six. You got a WAP, that's seven. A printer, that's eight. Your server or NAS, that's nine. You need one free port for a laptop or a consultant. We're at 10, that leaves two ports left. You add one more employee with a computer and a phone, and that router has all of its ports full. <laughs> it happens super fast. Now, I know a lot of our clients are real small, or you know, you've got a budget, you can't start out with something this big at, right at the beginning. You can get a little gigabit uh, router with Wi-Fi built in, and then you can get these little boxes that are PoE injectors. So basically they add power to the line. Now, a quick aside for something we, that some routers come with. Some, they come with VPN. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. A VPN secures the private network using encryption and other security mechanisms to ensure that only authorized users can access the network and the data cannot be intercepted. This type of network is designed to provide a secure encrypted tunnel in which to transmit data between remote users and the company network. Companies and organizations will typically use a VPN to communicate confidentially over a public network. Uh, it's also an option for remote workers and organizations with global offices um, to share data in a private manner. In essence, it makes it so when you're out of the office, you can remote in and the system acts as if you're on location. Now, we actually strongly recommend circumventing the whole VPN mess and using cloud data storage. Uh, you can do all the sharing you'd need to do using a secure device uh, rather than connecting to an inherently slow VPN. And some people will use a private VPN service to protect their online activity and identity. VPN services are especially useful when accessing public Wi-Fi hotspots because public wireless services may not be secure. Finally, all of your equipment should be rack mounted. As your business grows, this will make life so much better. The term IT closet can actually be true. Uh, rack mounting can be done in a closet, as you can see here. Although it does need to dissipate heat, these pieces of equipment do get hot and need to be cooled. Uh, but, you know, when your server, NAS, router are all in a secure enclosure, it means you can be sure everything is wired to where it is and it stays that way. Um, so the right is an example of a clean little enclosure that can be mounted to the wall just about anywhere. So it can be out of the way, but still easy to access when you need to make a change. Also, they look pretty good when you wire them up in a clean way. So speaking of wire, um, clean wire actually makes speed. Um, so you've gone out and you've bought a new router and a rack mount. You got wireless axe points and VoIP phones, and you want it to run as good as it says on the box. Now, uh, you know where you want to mount it, but it's time to start thinking about how you're going to set this up. How are you going to set up your network? Um, you probably have some Ethernet already running in your office, uh, but we need to make sure we're doing this in a way that will get you the best from your investment. You should be using Ether, Ethernet classed Cat5e or Cat6 to take advantage of the high speed router you just bought. Also, the cable needs to not have any kinks in it or it have been stepped on or rolled over by a chair. Inside that cable are four twisted pairs of wire. Uh, without going too far in depth with physics, uh, those pairs of wire are twisted at a very specific number of twists per foot, different for each pair. 
This makes it so that the information going down them does not bleed into the pair next to them called crosstalk. So as long as we're replacing cable, let's go ahead and color code them. Life's gonna be better when you can look at a cable and know if it goes to your phone or your computer. Also, go ahead and mark the ends of the cables so you know where they go, which port. Um, so now if you have an old mess of cables shoved in the corner of the wall with a desk pressed against the wall to hold them in place, let's get that replaced. And as we're running this cable, we're gonna run it in conduit. And that's not as scary as it sounds. You can buy inexpensive box conduit to run from a drop ceiling or along a wall to both protect your cable and make it look a lot better. Now this may seem like a purely aesthetic step, but I can't count the number of times I've rewired a building that had old cable crushed against the corner of a wall. Um, I've not only made the network function again, but users had speeds they never knew they were missing. I mean, at one place, they thought Wi-Fi was better than hardwired because it was so bad. Now, your network map may be the most important thing you learn today. You know, even if you change nothing about your network, you can implement a network map right now. Um, it can and should be applied to your current setup and everything moving forward. Now, you can make this as detailed or as simple as you want. As an IT guy, I'd probably make it in Excel, but you may want to make it in CAD. Um, there are a few things that you'll need to put in this, um, but for now, just mapping out where everything is and the color coding for your cable would be a good start. Um, you're going to have two cables for each work workstation, preferably color coded, say blue for standard Ethernet and white for PoE, um, so your phones for each station. Now, don't skimp on the cable. If someone uses a laptop or their cell phone, you want to run, uh, you're, you're going to want it to run it to their station anyway. Uh, first, you always want to uh, high hardwire your computers. It's better in every way. And properly set up, you can disconnect and automatically switch to Wi-Fi. Second, you never know when you're going to shuffle users around, and that station will need both a phone and a desktop. You know, cable is cheap. Time is not. Um, take a little time now um, so you don't lose a bunch later. If you map and measure everything ahead of time, you can buy pre terminated Earth Ethernet, have all the correct links uh, and colors, so you can just keep this all super organized. Now, there's a reason we're going to all this trouble. When you need help from an outside source with something beyond your knowledge level, you want to be able to show what you have to your IT contractor and have them know exactly how you were set up at a glance. I cannot tell you how much time I have wasted trying to trace down cables and figure out how a network is set up with no information. I, I could often walk into a business and fix the real issue in minutes, except for the hours it took me to map everything out. So you have your router mounted in a rack along with your modem and server and NAS. You have cable running down conduit to all your workstations, phones, cameras, printers. Write it all up. Which port goes to which device? Any static IP addresses you might have? Now that all the hardware is laid out, it's time for the software. Now your ISP sends signals to you and your modem translates that into something your network can understand. The router then hands that out to the device it's intended for. Your network knows where information goes because of IP addressing. You may have heard of IPv4 or numbers that look something like 192.168.1.0. This is a standard private IP address. Uh, you have one IP address that your ISP gives you. That's your public IP address. Then your router adds on specific device IP addresses so that whenever a request comes in, they know where to hand it to. Essentially, there's around 4 billion IPv4 addresses, which may seem like a lot, but with every person having a laptop, a desktop, an iPad, a phone, a smart watch, um, all needing IP addresses, and there being 7.5 billion people in the world, you can see how 4 billion isn't quite enough. Um, IPv6 is the new addressing convention, which is being started to be used. Instead of being 12 digits of base 10, it's 32 digits of hexadecimal, which is base 16. Translates into 340 on decillion, 282 decillion, 366 nonillion, 920 octillion, 938 septillion. Yeah, I had to look it up. <laughs> Needless to say, IPv6 is very confusing. You don't want to have to wrap your brain around it when it comes to your internal networking. You can go ahead and just disable it on your workstations. Uh, for your internal network, you should be using 192.168.0.0 through 
192.168.0.255. That's 255 usable addresses. That should be plenty, and it keeps the numbers super easy to work with. And if you're on a larger network and you want to know more about IP addressing, throw it in the questions box. Happy to answer those questions. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about what, how these addresses get used. Um, there's something called DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. It's a way of assigning changing IP addresses to devices on the network. With dynamic addressing, a device can have a different IP address every time it connects to the network. What that all means is that your router will be handing out IP addresses to all your devices on its own. Now this is great, but certain devices you're going to want to have a static or specific assigned IP address. Your printer is a good example that should have a static IP address. That way it's easy to get to. You know, we suggest you start at something like 200, so 192.168.0.200. Your NAS and server should have static IPs as well. Tape the IP address of your devices to them. That way you can walk up and know what it is, or more importantly, your IT can when you need them. And add that to your network map you're going to be making. This is going to flush out all the information on there. And remember, print out that network map. Put it with the router so you can go over and look at the router and see where everything is. So that's enough of the inside of the network. Let's look outside. DNS. DNS stands for Domain Name Servers. Uh, they're the internet's equivalent of a phone book. They maintain a directory of domain names and translate them to IP addresses. This is necessary because although domain names are easy for people to remember, computers or machines access websites based on IP addresses. It is important to note that your router will most likely default to your ISP's DNS. You're going to want to change that. Go ahead and log into your router and change your default DNS. Uh, you, your primary DNS should always be your local router itself. That way, you're always looking to within the network before you look outside of it. For your, your secondary and tertiary DNSs, we suggest something like Google DNS or Open DNS, uh, pretty much anything other than your internet service provider's DNS. Now, how you store that data, your data may seem like a bit of a leap for webinar and networking, uh, but stay with me. This is all going to make sense. So we recommend, actually, we strongly recommend uh, a cloud backup solution. The security in knowing that all your data is safe and accessible from anywhere is amazing. And this also basically eliminates the need for a VPN and makes sharing data super easy. Standard Dropbox business is $12.50 a month per uh, user. And that's for three terabytes of data. Uh, you need more space, it's only 20 bucks a month per user. And that's with unlimited space. Now, this can be significantly cheaper than maintaining your own network security device necessary for VPN and for sharing. And this leads into our next suggestion. And that's a NAS versus a server. Now, we all know what a server is, but what's a NAS? It's called Network Attached Storage. Basically, it's a stack of hard drives that act as external storage for all the devices on your network. If you're under 25 employees, a NAS is, in our opinion, a better solution than a server. Uh, NAS systems are perfect for small to medium businesses. They're simple to operate. A dedicated IT professional is often not required. Uh, they're lower cost. It's easy to back up your data, um, so it's always accessible when you need it. Uh, it's good at centralizing data storage in a safe and reliable way. Uh, there's just less to go wrong, and what you really need is secure storage. Now, with cloud backup, most of the functions that are provided by a server are outsourced to the cloud. Um, set your NAS so the hard drives are mirrored. This means that if you have two hard drives, each drive will be a copy of the other. That way, if one fails, the other still works and you lose no data. You just replace the broken one and then recopy everything. Also, every night you can pull one hard drive out, replace it with a spare, and take it home for off-site backup. The NAS will recopy all data to the spare drive and work just the same as it did. And remember, it's okay to call IT. In fact, sometimes you're going to need to. I can change the oil on my car. I can rotate the tires, check the fluid, replace the air filter, and wash it. But when a cylinder is misfiring or I get in a crash, I'm way out of my depth. And to try to fix it would be silly. Uh, I've got a guy for that. For your computer, that's your IT. 
I mean, hey, we all specialize. I'm not a landscape architect just as much as you may not be an IT, IT person or even a tech savvy person. Running all the cables should be pretty easy and making the network map might be fun. But if you're not comfortable with setting up a router or a NAS or getting static IPs set for your printer, that's okay. Go ahead and hire a professional. Have them set everything up. Once it's set up, make sure they go over all of it with you. Check that you understand what happens if any one part fails. They should update your network map, have detailed notes on every piece of the setup. They should make you a packet that you can go through yourself to replace any part and set a new one back up or be able to hand to anyone else you hire uh, to get you fixed up in minutes rather than days. So I know we've gone over a bunch of stuff in a very short period of time. Let's go over what we have now. So we have a wall mounted rack of some type. Um, in there we have our modem, our router, our switch, and NAS. Uh, the NAS is backed up to the cloud and is where all the workstations store their work. You've got nice clean wire run to all equipment, printers, desktops, even laptops. We have nice clean wire um, on PoE running to our WAP and our VoIP. We have an IP address of all the equipment marked on the equipment. And most important, a digital and hard copy of the network map with all this information. So remember that worst case I was talking about? If one of the hard drives in the NAS dies, there's a backup still running. If the NAS itself dies, the data's fine and um, it's in the cloud and it can be pulled down um, and each workstation can access it on its own. If the internet goes down, the internal network will still function and the NAS still has all the data on the cloud. If a switch or router goes down, you can pick up a temporary one um, and be back up and running as fast as you can get back from the store. I mean, downtime due to mechanical or software failure is going to happen. It's just a question of how fast do you recover. So I mean, with all of your network all dialed in, you, honestly, you save money and you work faster. Now, time for a little audience participation. I know I've gone over a bunch of information. Do we have any questions? Anybody need clarifying on anything? Yeah, come on. We got so let's get some good questions in here, people. I was uh, I know there was uh, quite a bit to cover, but um, we uh, purposely left a lot of time to go over questions. So uh, we're we're hoping you'll have some questions. Um, but yeah, um, uh, one thing that I I definitely am a fan of after I found out about it is when I was hooking up our little rack here. Um, I, I was like, well, hmm, I don't know, how should I wire it all up? And um, I started to look into the little network cables and I was like, oh, you can get them, you know, 12 inch, 18 inch, 24 inch. I'm like, oh, I can get them perfectly sized. Okay. So I was looking into that, but I saw all the different colors they come in. And so I, I had fun with it. You know, like the, to me, the, the cables going to the cameras were a certain color and then a different color for that going from the camera box to the switch. Um, same as, you know, to the, uh, to the phone system, obviously. So all the phone cables are white because they're PoE, but then that comes into the phone switch. So I wanted that to be a different color going back to the uh, master equipment closet rather than the, uh, the internet, which is red. And so, you know, it, at first it sounds a little crazy having all these different colored cables, but you get in there and you look and you see the little chart saying what color is which, and it really helps to make sense of it. And so, you know, just the little things like that are a lot of fun to uh, just kind of take charge of your setup. So um, just want to throw that out there. But um, I don't see any questions coming in. So um, did you have a couple of, uh, um, didn't we have a couple of those hardware recommendations uh, slides ready for this time, Brian? I do. Um... So I know I ran over these real quick, but here's some ideas of pricing for things. Um, that router I showed you, that Cisco router, it's rack mount, has PoE, has all the stuff that, that we were talking about. It's gigabit. It's a $500 router. That's something that's going to be able to expand with your company. Um, that's, you know, if you've got, a, you've got two employees already then you honestly are going to want to go with something like that. If you're a sole proprietor, then getting something like this little TP link is not a bad thing. You know, it's gigabit 
And no, it doesn't have POE, but you can get a little POE injector. I mean, it's 20 bucks per workstation. You can get this up and running and be on a gigabit ethernet in you know minutes. And these are super easy to set up. Um, and then, you know, let's say you have two employees and you get a third. And even this Cisco router, using it exclusively, you're all out of ports on that. We went over that. Um, actually, I grabbed some PoE switches to give you an idea. Um, you can use switches to increase the size of your network. These are just some examples. Um, they're, you know, absolutely scalable. You know, you realize that, you know, you're in a good position and you're going to be hiring four new people. Um, you can grab an eight port PoE switch and then an eight ports uh, standard switch, throw those into your rack. You're only using two ports off of your router and you really don't have to change anything about how the rest of your network was set up and you can add four more people and be ready for four more with, you know, a couple of eight port routers. And, you know, um, that just reminds me of a really, really important point to make is um, a, a really fundamental um, architecture of your network is to to have it be independent from whatever your internet provider has. So, you know, a lot of times like AT&T, they'll give you a, a wireless uh, modem that comes with four ports on the back. So it's a router and a modem and it's a wireless access point. And I would recommend using literally none of that, um, that you want your own router, you want your own wireless access points, um, because what that gives you the flexibility to do is when fiber is available and you can just simply go, oh, hey, let's switch to fiber or let's upgrade to cable. Let's get rid of AT&T finally and switch to cable. So you just simply replace that modem. So basically the, the short version is, you know, when they provide you with this multi-use thing, treat it as only a modem. Get into its configuration, turn off the wireless portion, um, turn off everything else, only have one uh, cable from it running to your own router. So that way you have full control and it's going to be a better quality router. Even the cheapest D-Link router you can possibly find is typically going to be far better than whatever an ISP will give you. Um, you know, I, I've seen ISP provided routers that were blocking the traffic to the printer. So we couldn't get the network printing figured out. You know, and it was just like, you know, and that was expensive, you know, that's, you know, $75 an hour for, for my time to figure it out and for to then go and now finally buy that separate router and then unhook all that from the AT&T provided one. Um, so that's definitely something you want to plan in. And there was one other thing that I, I had a slide on, and that was the uh, the WAP. Because, I mean, we've all seen the, the VoIP phones, but you may not be familiar with these because they're usually mounted up on a wall or in the ceiling. Um, they're unobtrusive, um, and, you know, they're not terribly expensive. I mean, you can get a little omnidirectional one for, you know, under 30 bucks, or like this Ubiquity um, is... You know, it's $135, but it's got a 400-foot range. I, you probably won't be in a building that needs a 400-foot range. Um, and then they're directional. Um, some are omnidirectional, some are directional. Um, and that gives you that flexibility we are talking about, that ability to change where your Wi-Fi is. If you're down the street and you realize uh, that you can get on your work Wi-Fi, it's too strong and it's placed incorrectly. You don't wanna be broadcasting to the whole neighborhood, hey, here's our Wi-Fi, and you can sit at the coffee shop and spend hours hacking into it. So, just a little tip. And is that, is that the tail end of our yeah, hardware wrecks? Okay, I well. I have suggestions, but. Exactly right. Um, so um, yeah, I think you know the to, for for my my number one recommendations are always is is yeah you got to go to VoIP if you don't have VoIP phones now, um, that's the number one thing you got to do. We ended up saving about a thousand dollars a month um, by switching to VoIP phones here. That that was it. Six lines. We had about six 
um, I think we had a we had a six line box, and then from that we switched to VoIP, and yeah, thousand dollars a month less. So granted, you know, we make a lot of long distance phone calls here. Um, so you know, there's just something to keep in mind. Um, we do have a question. Thank you, Linda, for chiming in with a question. Everyone else, do what Linda did and think of a question. <laughs> but uh, Linda asks if uh, the directional WAP is the same thing as a Wi-Fi extender. Uh, typically, it is not. So a Wi-Fi extender, what it typically does, and you know, each one is different, but um, they're going to take the signal that it's received you say in most of them they're standalone so you just plug them into an outlet and it's set up so that it catches the signal from wherever your um your wi-fi is coming from you know whether that's your it's built into your router it's typically what they're set up for it catches the signal and then it retransmits it again so a wap actually gets a ethernet cord piped straight to it and sends the signal itself. Now, this is significantly faster uh, than taking the signal that it catches and then resending it. It's adding, when you use an extender, typically it's, it's basically adding one more device in the chain and in the weakest links of the chain, which is the actual Wi-Fi part, where the signal bounces off a wall and then bounces off the cat and then it gets this signal. And so it's distorted, so it has to retranslate that back into the correct information so it slows it down yeah and as for like the you know the the recommendation on well gee should i put in an, another wap or just a wi-fi extender in an office that is that is a um a, a good dilemma um basically i've been very impressed with with wi-fi extenders um it, you know i i ended up um i just you know found i had really bad wi-fi upstairs um in my home and so I just put a little Belkin Wi-Fi extender upstairs and there we go, done, perfect. Um, and so it's really incredible um, how, how good they can be for a little $35 thing, you know, without having to run an ethernet cable up to, to another WAP. So, um, you know, you want to, you know, feel free to use the Wi-Fi extenders. I just definitely, you know, I know certainly there's going to be some IT professional out there who's going to say, oh, don't ever use Wi-Fi extenders. No, 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 you absolutely can. Um, th they work really well. Um, but yeah, they are going to require at least one WAP. Um, then uh, Amanda has a very good question here. Um, she asks if we have any tips for finding a good IT person for a small office um, versus a medium or large office. Anything that they should ask specifically. Um, I would say the, the main thing I would offer is, like we said, with uh, create your own little O-poop uh, binder. <laughs> I think the main thing is it's going to be hard to sort of say ahead of time, but what you're going to rate them on is after the first time they, they come in. And so you say, here is my binder. It Here's my list of uh, my devices, how my network is set up. It includes your, you know, your admin password to your router, things like that. And it includes the, uh, the uh, text file, um, file name location of each of those documents. And so as for instance, they hook up a new printer for you, um, what you want them to do is to update that documentation. And that would be my recommendation how you assess an IT person is when they say, okay, I set up this new printer and have all of your stations connected to it. What, you're just gonna tell me that verbally? No, I want you to show me the updated printout, of course, that you even printed on the new printer, um, and how it's added to my, um, my little red binder. And it shows the IP address of the printer. It shows the version and the type of the uh, drivers that were installed. It shows the folder of where you saved those drivers. Um, it shows, you know, all of that information in a little text file. They printed it. They added it up. So you're just that much easier to um, take care of things in the future. Um, I can't necessarily think of anything I would ask someone ahead of time. Can you think of anything, Brian, that you would sort of to assess someone's IT prowess before hiring them? I mean, 
without being an IT person, it, it's hard to ask the right question and know the right answer to it. Yeah. Um, I, I would, I would more ask what, their plan for you is when something goes wrong. Ask them, hey, so let's say it's um, Saturday night at uh, 10 p.m. and something goes wrong. Are you going to set me up in a way where I can fix it? Or where are you going to empower me to be able to work on stuff? Or, you know, am I going to learn anything? Or are you just going to come in, tell me it's better and walk away? Um, cause to me, a good IT person is, you know, you're going to be there with them and they're going to let you know, Hey, this is what I'm doing. This is why, and, and what you can do to help them not need to be there. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that's, um, that's a good one. Um, and then, uh, Kyle has a really good question on NAS, uh, recommendations, uh, particularly besides a uh, Synology and TerraMaster. Um, I, I would throw in QNAP, like the QNAP ones, but also um, that would be a place I would immediately just go to newegg.com. Um, I really rely on their reviews there. And so that's a, a great category where I could go to their um, to the NAS section and sort by highest rated and just kind of look through and, and, and find out about a new brand I hadn't even heard of. Um, but, but I think with a NAS, for instance, you know, it's going to be really more um, looking at what is it I want out of that NAS? Do I want removable drive sleds? Do I want the ability to have a MySQL database built onto it? Do I want it to have integration with a cloud backup that's by the same company? Um, a lot of them have those sorts of things. Sometimes you just literally don't want any of that. Um, but particularly I would read those reviews because what really kills a NAS is the, uh, the OS. And, and you know, how easy is it, for instance, to have a folder um, be only accessible by certain users. And that really is a breakdown of most NAS devices that I've seen is they have a really uh, poorly designed, poorly maintained little web-based control panel. And so your better ones will have an actual uh, more Linux OS that maybe um, goes so far as to have a command line uh, interface. Um, some of the more higher end NASs will even have a Windows storage server, which are bit, frankly really nice. Um, so um, it's just nice having something that is Windows and I can just um, RDP into it. So um, th those are really nice, but at that point, you're paying a fair grip for something and maybe at that point, just instead invest that into a better uh, cloud storage, you know, go get the, the premium Dropbox account, um, you, you know, and have more of a simpler NAS that is just sort of a rotating um, kind of cold storage. Um, so, but it, it really is all, wh where does this NAS fit in your scheme, you know? And I think a key one is, you know, all those photos that you assemble, I hope you're taking 15, 20 megapixel photos of every job. Those add up quick and honestly do not necessarily need to be paying for um, with a, a cloud backup with you know your decades old photos and, and that's something where you might want to look into just um, you know two NASs um, that so you have your data duplicated you know one at home one at the office something like that so your your, your large 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 terabytes of data um, you have copies of they're offline um, but you're not paying this cloud um, rate to host them. So that, that's a good usage of a NAS as well, where again, then you don't need the advanced user control of a more expensive NAS. And how about you, Brian? You have any NAS recommendations? No, I think you pretty much covered it. I mean, for me personally, I, I just, I always look for one where it's going to be real easy for me to just walk up yank out a drive and throw another one in and it automatically starts copying over. Um, exactly. Yeah. I, I want, I want the ability to every night pull out a drive and throw in my backup and then go home with my, my 
my offsite backup and know that all of my critical data, even if the building burns down and Dropbox goes bust and, and all their servers crash, I still have all of my critical data on this hard drive and I can throw it in a hard drive sled and I can plug it into my computer network and I can just be working again. So, you know, the world mm -hmm. comes crashing down around me and I'm still able to push out that deadline tomorrow at 8 a.m. Exactly. And that would be, uh, that'd be raid one mirroring. Um, I would definitely, same thing. A lot of those NASAs will, um, sometimes I've seen them where they default to raid zero striping, which makes <laughs> no sense to me. Um, if you're going to have two hard drive sleds, I want that data mirrored and I want to do exactly like you just said. I want to pop one out. So I have my offline sled, boom, and I buy a third sled and rotate that in. Um, we got a really good question from Wayne. Um, if you want to go back to a slide on uh, network addressing, but he was specifically asking about the static IP address and he wanted to know um, how to do that. And um, I, can't remember, I can't remember which slide would best show that, but basically, yeah, with there, that was right. There we go. And um, even though we're showing setting a static address here in Windows, this would be really specifically only at the server. Um, you really should never have a static address for a, a workstation. Um, just use DHCP for that. Um, but for a server, it's going to save you a ton of frustration, particularly because one of the things that frees you up to do, uh, you got to remember this one, is to not have to have a monitor <laughs> on that server. You know, you want to be able to just remote into that server over the network. So you have just a simple rack mounted server sitting in there. And so you just pull up your little console and you go right into it. And if that server is DHCP, how the heck do you connect to it? You're always trying go, I can't find it. I get what IP address does it have today? You know, so you definitely want static addressing for things like your server, absolutely for your printer. Oh, I, if I, man, I, that one, uh, I just, it kills me. Have you ever seen that, Brian? You try to, you go to hook up someone's network printer and it's set to DHCP. And I'm like, why? Why, why do that to yourself? <laughs> and that's the first thing you want to do on a printer is open up the manual and figure out how to assign it a static address. So now, and then of course that goes right into the binder. Here's your printer. It's set to 222. Nice, fun, easy address to remember easy to set up that IP port on every machine and it's just going to be great. Um, you got any, anything further to say on static addressing? Um, the one thing about static addressing that I've run into before is um, so you the, the, let's use the printer as an example. You set a static IP address on the printer. Let's say it's 222, but on the router, you haven't gone and made that IP address outside of the scope of DHCP. So every once in a while I've, I've run into where, you know, you haven't also excluded that on the, on the router. So basically the router has a set of numbers that it's going to hand out, you know, generally, you know, we're going to say, uh, you know, zero to 255. Well, really you don't want that whole range because you're going to have some static ones like 222 for your printer. So cut it off at 200. Tell the router it's only allowed to hand out zero through 200 as you know, changing IP addresses. And then 200 and up, 200 to, you know, to 255, those are reserved for your static IP addresses. Because what'll happen is you tell, you know, your printer tells, you know, is set itself to uh, 192.168.0.222. But your router doesn't know that. So it goes and it hands out 222 to one of the computers. Well, now you're trying to send your print jobs to Joe's computer over there. And then, yeah, it's just a mess. So that, that's one side note about static IP addressing it. And, and particularly a reason why it's always good to do it from the router rather than the, um, the workstation or device itself if you can. Yeah, and, and you know a lot of DHCP servers, like I know Linksys, um, will very commonly start at 100, and so by default, the, um, that's their kind of standard is they're leaving the uh, one 
1 through 99 um, available for, for statics. So you can also, um, you know, it's, it's a matter of just simply diving into your router and seeing um, if that is the case and then, it, you know, to just set it as such. Myself, I've always preferred having the uh, 1 through 99 for my PoE devices and then my uh, 254 down to 200 for my static um, IP devices. And it, it's tomato potato. I know I, I, I ran into someone who was like, no, servers should always be dot one because it's faster to uh, find it on the network than if it's dot two five four. And I don't think I've ever laughed as hard as I did. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, we got another good question here on our opinion on uh, Western Digital Red Pro hard drives versus the Seagate Iron Wolf. Or I don't know, not to say versus, just and. Um, personally, I would say they're both fantastic. Um, I, I think Western Digital and Seagate are both fantastic companies. Um, you know, for me, the big thing with, with drives is um, – something I got very into the habit of certainly with uh, uh, NAS drives is um, buy an extra one. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and at first it may, you, you may, again, might be something where someone might laugh at you or something, but just buy an extra drive. You're, you're out what another 65 bucks. And so what? So it's sitting in a closet because the thing is, is when you get, to a point where you have to replace a drive and you get a new drive and oh look now they don't even you can't even find that one terabyte you know 15,000 k rpm drive anymore they only have the two terabyte ones right so then if you have a raid array set up on your device um, it's a pain you end up having to replace all the drives and it's a real pain especially with rated drives and so to just save yourself and buy an extra one um, at the time um, but um, yeah I, I myself have not fiddled with the Seagate Iron Wolves um, I have seen the the WD Reds and they're they're fine um, um, I think just as a general across the board thing i've always been happy with western digital drives all the way down to is it blue is the new economy one or is that green i can't remember um I, they've all been fantastic to me i don't know what do you think Brian? um you know the branding to me has never mattered that much i i have flip-flopped between seagate and western digital over the years i've never had any real issues with them but on a enterprise level when we're talking about a business um, it's not, you know, it's critical that that data is secure and that it's going to last a long time. So what I actually look at is not so much which brand, but what kind of warranty they have. Um, if you're going to go out and buy, so let's say you're, you're going to buy a two bay NAS and, you know, you got th two users plus yourself. So you're getting 12 terabyte drives and you need two drives for the NAS one is your take home backup and one as your um, backup, you know, that sits in the closet, you're buying four drives all at once. So they're all probably going to be from the same batch. When one of them dies, there's a pretty good percentage chance that the rest of them are not short lived after. So having a five year warranty, knowing that you have a five year warranty and what that warranty backs is you know important to me um, that's that's kind of the the direction i look at it because this is it's a um it's a consumable um it's something that you're going to wear out um, just like tires on your car um, it just takes a little bit longer um, so the warranty on it is really critical because if one of my drives fails i'm going to send that in on warranty and get another one sending back. I'm gonna grab that one out of the closet and throw it in. But now I know there's a very good chance that the other three that I have may may die on me relatively soon. Um, so now that's that's kind of where I look at it from. And of course, and then the the real answer though is of course. Mm, why are we even talking about hard drives? <laughs> um, you know, so like the thing we did is we we here we got those little the the Samsung. Uh, T5s, the little two, uh, two terabyte um, SSDs, uh, 
and that's our offsite backup. Um, so you know um, we 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 cycle those, and they're great. You know, two terabytes on that little tiny thing, um, and you know, I mean, we've been an all SSD office for quite a while now, and, and I mean, I just it is so past the point to have a spinner. Uh, I mean, you know, what what is this, you know, amount of content where you need that many terabytes? And if you do, you can still raid Stripe SSDs. <laughs> you really can. Um, you know, yes, it's expensive, but it's like, what is that cost of when a hard drive fails, which it will compared to an SSD? Um, you know, and the the speed difference of SSDs, the, the 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 less heat, the less noise, everything. It is just yeah. Um, so that would be you know the, my big comment there is boy, I am so happy with with our little Samsung portable SSDs as offsite backup. Those are just amazing. Yeah, that's uh, it used to be um, you know back in the day, somebody would ask how do I make my computer better? I've had this computer for a year or two years. What do I do? And I, you know, invariably it was add more RAM. That, that's not true anymore. Now, my first thing I ask is, do you have a spinning disk hard drive? Throw in an SSD. That's going to make your life so exponentially better. You, you will not even understand. You don't understand how much better it is till you have it. You go, oh God, what, why was I not using this before? And remember the best part about upgrading to an SSD um, is if you have children, when you're done, you get to take apart the hard drive together, <laughs> which is so much fun. Oh my gosh, to see how they work on the inside, it's pretty cool. Um, but um, on that note, um, I think we will go ahead and bid everyone happy weekend. Um, keep the ideas coming. Anything else comes up, uh, you know, shoot us an email. Um, like we said, this is kind of meant to be a companion to the hardware recommendations. As you can see, we were, you know, prepping a lot of recommendations on stuff and some fantastic questions on those. Thank you. So please uh, look, be on the lookout for the hardware rec uh, webinar, which will be in November, I believe. And um, otherwise, have a great weekend.